throughout the, the last two days, participants in uh, five different areas have been competing uh, in different rounds uh, with adjudications, and uh, those tabulations came together um, last night uh, to result in today's finalists that you'll be uh, watching and hearing today. Um, this first round is extemporaneous speaking. Um, at uh, no time um, during the events uh, are you able to leave once we start. Thank you. The question reads, is enough being done to bring North Korea back into the world community? Once again, the question reads, is enough being done to bring North Korea back into the in world community? Judges ready? On February 20th of this year, Grainy CCTV images of Kim Jong-nam capturing his last moments before death flooded international news headlines. The recent murder of Kim Jong-nam, the brother of no North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un, not only shocked the international community, but once again shed light on the authoritarian regime of North Korea. Over the past few decades, North Korea has been noted by the international community for not only the missile program, but also for recent humanitarian crises. And with this recent event, interest in North Korea has once again surged, as well as criticism. This naturally leads us to the question, is enough being done to bring North Korea back into the world community? And to that question, the answer stands at a resounding no. No for the three following reasons. One. North Korea is continuously economically isolated from the world. Two, there is growing hostile attitude in terms of the military for North Korea. And three, North Korea is continuously isolated from cooperating in key international social issues. Starting with my first point, that North Korea is continuously economically isolated from the world community. North Korea has continuously continuously isolated from the North in International Economic Community in terms of the idea that as reported by CNN in January 19th of this year, there's a recent commitment of UN sanctions against North Korea. This is specifically targeting the North Korean economy and that key Western nations as well as regional ones are agreeing to limit the North Korean power in terms of the economy in order to make sure that there is less influence for North Korea to exert on the world. Unfortunately for North Korea, this trend has been followed by their key allies, pointing towards Washington Post's article on February 18th of this year, that one of the few and key allies of North Korea, China, recently made the decision to suspend North Korean coal imports in order to comply with the UN sanctions, agreeing with the Western nation's opinions in terms of isolating North Korea from the world economic community. This brings light in that we acknowledge that North Korea is not being put back into the world community. In fact, they're being increasingly isolated and that they're taken out from the world economy. China is also not supporting North Korea in terms of economic benefits. And with that, the only logical Korean an coherent answer to this, an to this question is that North Korea is being continuously isolated in terms of the world economy. Moving on to my second point. In terms of the international community, there is hostile attitude in terms of North Korea's military. As reported by Feb New York Times on February 17th of this year, satellite images captured stepped up activities inside of North Korea in terms of the military program, as well as recent mis missile testings that grew fear for the international community in terms of the improvement and the rapid process that North Korea is showing in terms of their military capabilities. And to that, the response was hostile from the international community. 
As reported by Reuters in February 27th of this year, senior officials from the United States, South Korea, and Japan came together in order to discuss how to limit funding for the North Korean military regime, military plan, as well as stepped up any processes and improved the process of making sure that North Korea was isolated in terms of the military, that South Korea and the United States regained their their commitment towards stepping up their military campaigns in order to make sure that North Korea was limited in terms of their military capacity. Once again, we are shown the opposite of integration for North Korea. We're increasingly isolating as well as negatively, at, there's ne we're negatively responding to North Korea's actions in terms of the military. Now, on to my final point, that North Korea is being isolated from cooperating in key international social issues. There are two key international social issues that we see North Korea being isolated from. Starting my first one, in terms of climate change. As reported by Guardian on November 4th of, this year, of last year, the world came together in order to ratify as well as implement the Paris Climate Change Agreement. However, North Korea was completely isolated from this process. Not only were they not a part of ratification and implementation, but also their statistics and their data in terms of climate change are not even released to the public and the international community. This shows that there is a lack of commitment from North Korea's part to solve key international issues, as well as a lack of cooperation between the world community and North Korea itself. Adding on, as reported by New York Times on January 28th of this year, another key international social issue that North Korea is continuously isolated from is in terms of human rights. There's a rise of human rights issues as well as international concern towards human rights inside of North Korea. And the United Nations is a key body in the international atmosphere, in the international environment, in which they facilitate any process, processes to solve any human rights violations. However, North Korea is completely isolated from that process and that neither the United Nations can go in to help nor is North Korea willing to accept that help. And with that, in terms of the social issues that is prevalent inside of this world today, North Korea is completely isolated from the process of solving it as well as acknowledging it. Therefore, when we ask the question today, is enough being done to bring North Korea back into the international community? The answer stands at a resounding no. No for the three reasons. That one, North Korea is increasingly economically isolated, not only from key Western powers, but also from their key ally, China. Two, there is an increase of hostile attitude in terms of North Korea's military. Once again, adding more negativity towards North Korea rather than integrating them inside our world's community. And lastly, we are isolating North Korea from cooperating in key international social issues. And if they're not a part of that, we, it is very hard for us to acknowledge that North Korea is being brought back into the world community. Thank you.
question reads, will Trump make America great again? I repeat, will Trump make America great again? Returning from a recent trip to the United States, my father got me only one thing. It was a red hat emblazoned with the now iconic phrase, make America great again. And the ubiquity of this theme in American political discourse, as well as its commonality in our world today, got me thinking, will Donald Trump make America great again? But first, before we answer that question, it's important to frame what we mean when we say great. And what we're looking at, really, when we say great, is we're looking at the resilience and the strength of the fundamental pillars that undermine American democracy. So let's look at the current political situation in the United States. We're seeing that although radical, Trump's agenda is looking increasingly unlikely to pass. We're seeing institutions that are growing increasingly bold to oppose his most radical measures, and we're seeing a re-energized political system and thus, when we look at all of these factors, we can actually conclude that yes, Donald Trump will make America great again, but perhaps not for the reasons he's hoping. So first, let's delve right into that first point here, which is that although radical, Trump's, uh, uh, Trump's radical agenda looks unlikely to pass through Congress. On the 27th of February, the Brookings Institution reported that Donald Trump's health policy agenda is looking increasingly wobbly every day and it looks unlikely that they will come up with anything to replace Barack Obama's Affordable Care Act, a key pillar of Trump's campaign. Thus, we can see that the plan that ensured 20 million Americans will ultimately stay in place, and the fundamental pillar of American democracy, that is, Congress, in their ability to reshape uh, American health care policy, will stay intact and be strengthened because of it. Additionally, we find that on the 21st of November, the New York Times reported that Donald Trump will ultimately need Congress's approval for much of his policy agenda, including repealing the ACA, including renegotiating trade deals, and ultimately deporting immigrants will all need the full approval and funding of Congress. And we'll get to that point of funding later. So what we see here is that Congress is growing increasingly bold in imposing Trump in all uh, aspects. Lastly, for this point, on the 4th of February, the New York Times reported that the 9th District Appeals Court in Washington State struck down Donald Trump's immigration ban that banned immigration from nine different Middle Eastern countries. And ultimately, what we're looking at here is that Donald Trump can honestly not do much to undermine American democracy. There are always these checks on power that will keep him from doing anything of great harm to the country. And this key point of the courts brings us to our next point, which is that America's institutions are looking increasingly vital. They're looking like they are being re-energized and are growing increasingly bold at opposing him at every single turn. We find that courts on the 4th of February of this year reported that, it, that this action would only become more common as Donald Trump continues to roll out his policies. In a sense, as he continues to put more policies out there, the courts will continue to strike down the ones that would undermine the fundamental pillars of American democracy. And the Independent on the 29th, uh, just 29 days ago, reported that a dissent memo within the State Department had gained over 900 signatures from career diplomats, signaling that even within Donald Trump's executive branch, there is significant opposition to his reforms. We're seeing that the institutions that are American executive agencies are standing up against policies that would be detrimental to the health of the country. And ultimately, they're becoming not only more respected, but they're stronger because of it. And lastly, for this point, The Economist on the 23rd of February reported that the Republican Congress that is currently in office is unlikely in any case to appropriate the funding needed for Donald Trump's plans to deport millions of undocumented immigrants. In a sense, we're seeing that even though Donald Trump's campaign promises caused fear for many, it's looking increasingly likely that America's most vital institutions will continue to do their job and stand up against them. And lastly, we're seeing a completely re-energized political system, both in the chambers of governments and, on the and in the towns and cities across America. We're seeing that not only 
on the 20, did The Economist report on the 23rd of February that there has been a fundamental restructuring um, of democratic policy in light of Donald Trump's emergence in order to counter him at all levels, at, at state and national levels, in local elections, and in the presidency. We're finding that the Democrats, which were criticized for being inactive beforehand, have re-energized themselves as the main opposition to Donald Trump. And I would argue the American political system is better off because of this re-energization. Additionally, we're finding that there are bold challenges from members of Congress. For example, we can see that on the 18th of February, Senator Elizabeth Warren was ejected from congressional chambers after standing up against one of Donald Trump's more controversial nominees. We're seeing that an action that would have been unimaginable in other times of American politics have now become commonplace. We're seeing that the fundamental checks on power that Congress provides are being used to their full extent. And because of this, we're finding that American democracy is being pushed to its test, but ultimately, it's passing that test. And American democracy is standing up against Trump. And we're also, and that, but those things are not enough if we're not seeing mass mobilization on the streets. And to that, um, to that end, we're seeing far greater voter participation, which is a vital key aspect of American politics. Because the Washington Post reported on the 10th of November that part of the reason that Donald Trump was successful was because Democratic voter participation dropped drastically because there was a lack of, uh, there was a lack of excitement about their nominee. But we're seeing now that the Democratic Party has been galvanizing participation in the political system. We saw on the 21st of January, uh, foreign policy reported that there were record-breaking crowds at protest at protests to oppose Donald Trump's not only non nomination, but his, pol his policy and record on women's rights. We're seeing that the political system is being re-galvanized as people on the opposition and in Donald Trump's own party are standing up against his most uh, destructive policies. And I would argue the American political system is better off because of it. It's being increasingly strengthened as a result of these measures. And this is why I would argue that if the greatest threat to democracy is indifference, then Americans need not worry in, under Donald Trump's rule. Thank you.
is America's global influence diminishing? Is America's global influence diminishing? When I was a kid, I loved to watch kung fu movies, especially ones with Bruce Lee. But what I loved the most was his dialogue, the way that he was able to portray a message through his words, not only his actions. And I would like to share a quote with everyone today, which is, knowledge gives you power, but character, respect. And I think this relates to my question today, which is, will America's influence diminish globally? And sadly, yes. And this is due to three reasons. The first one being their leader, the second one being international relations, and the third one being other countries' actions. So I'll give you some background. America is considered a superpower country. They are a permanent member in the Security Council within the United Nations, and they are also have veto power as a P5 country. But I'll move on to my first point, which is their leader. Why is their leader such a main and key point when asking the question whether or not their influence will diminish globally? Well, their president right now is Donald J. Trump, and this is coming from The Independent on January 24th. But what is so interesting is his approval rating when he first reached office in January. He had the lowest approval rating for a president in 40 years, being at only 43%. This coming from Newsweek on January 23rd. So this means that his people are not really there to back him up. So he doesn't have influence over his own people on a national scale. How can this be okay? Because America won't be able to influence people globally if their leader can't influence people nationally. Now, moving on, they, Donald Trump has also made some questionable decisions when reaching the White House so far. This coming from the New York Times on February 16th. But what exactly has he done? He's done the seven country ban as an executive order. This coming from Al Jazeera on February 4th. What else? Well, he's made a phone call to Taiwan. Well, this coming from The Economist on February 5th. And he has elected and picked and now sworn in his education pick, which believes that guns should be in schools, and he's elected and also sworn in now the head of his, his environment pick who denies climate change. This coming from the Huffington Post on January 20th. So if you have such things happening and you're not helping your international relations, these people can't respect you because even though you have power, manpower with your military, if people don't respect you and don't believe you have good character, how can you influence people? Which moves on to my second point, which is international relations. The seven country ban, which I mentioned in my first point, is a key point when talking about their diminishing global influence because countries are upset, mainly Iraq. This coming from CBS News on March 1st. Why? Because the Iraqi people have been fighting next to the US in war, yet now Donald Trump doesn't want their people coming in the country. How is this going to help influence? If they don't believe that your country is going to help them, how do you influence them towards you? How do you help and how do you have them help you? What else do you have? You have Taiwan. Trump made a call to the Taiwan president and this is coming from BBC on February 16th. Yet this was unsanctioned. He called and was like, hey, president, like, what do you feel? And then, you have the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, replying and saying that, you know what, maybe we'll have relations with Trump because he believes in the one China policy. That was what, was the, phone, that was what the phone call was about. Trump talking about the one China policy with the president of Taiwan. A little bit of a touchy subject, you might call it. So you also have the fact that the EU is not that happy with America right now. And um, the EU is a major part in our world and a key player in economy, po economically, politically, and socially. And what is this about? The European Parliament's visa plans for US citizens. What has happened only just today and yesterday? Well, the EU Parliament allowed for the migration committee in the EU to allow for American citizens not to have visa-free travel to the EU anymore, because America wasn't following what the EU wanted for visa-free travel too. So this is coming from CNN on January 1st. 
So what's happening? The EU isn't happy with them. Middle Eastern countries aren't happy with them, especially since, as I go back to the seven country ban, those seven countries are mainly Muslim religious wise. And if you are denying some sort of religion to enter your country, you are also losing influence over 1.6 billion people. This is coming from RT News on February 4th. So when I move on to my third point, which is other countries' actions and how this is being reciprocated by the US, you see countries like North Korea, formerly known as the DPRK or the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. What happened? They, fi they fired an intercontinent intercontinental ballistic missile. What does this mean? It means that Donald Trump took to Twitter and was like, they can't actually fire one. They don't have the resources. This is coming from Twitter. But if you have a president who isn't willing to accept the fact that there are nuclear powers out there other than themselves, how can you have influence over other countries? You also have the fact that Israel is planning 2,500 settlements in Palestine. Palestine being backed by the US. This coming from Twitter, this coming from RT News on January 5th. If you have Israel going into your ally and saying, you know what, we're just gonna take over a little area now and you not doing anything, that means that you don't have influence already. You don't have power over someone already because they're willing to act out against you. Then you have Iran. They're planning on buying and testing nuclear weapons once, they're, once their sanctions have lifted. Well, they've already tested something. Their naval crew tested a missile in the middle of the ocean that's coming from Reuters on February 24th. So if you don't have power over major countries, including countries that have nuclear power, because your leader is ineffective, because international relations are not good, and because other countries are not willing to listen to you, then your global dominance has already diminished and is diminishing further. So when asked the question, is America's global dominance diminishing? My answer is still an unequivocal yes. Thank you.
In his final play, The Cherry Orchard, esteemed Russian playwright Anton Chekhov famously said, if a disease has many remedies, it is incurable. If we apply Chekhov's words to the context of international affairs, we find no better application than the conflict in Syria. Since 2011, governments around the world have proposed solutions for a sustainable peace in Syria. But time and time again, these solutions have all but failed. Now, as the conflict intensifies, many are desperately asking, is a sustainable solution in Syria possible? Unfortunately, the answer is a clear and unequivocal no. First, the involvement of foreign powers in Syria is undermining efforts to promote peace. Second, the Syrian regime is growing increasingly aggressive with its military campaigns. And third, even if peace prevail, prevails, if peace prevails under Assad, Syria will continue to exist in a state of instability. Let's begin with my first point, that the involvement of foreign powers in the Syrian conflict is undermining efforts to broker peace. On January 24th, the New York Times reported that Iran, Russia, and Turkey have all agreed to enforce a ceasefire in Turkey, but they have stopped short of providing any details as to how this ceasefire would be enforced. Now, on, a, on the surface, it appears that this means that these foreign powers are committed to peace. But if we dig deeper, we find that that is far from the case. You see, this ceasefire was proposed at a time when these foreign powers' allies in the Syrian regime witnessed unprecedented victories. They had recently acquired new rebel-controlled territories, and as a result, their allies, Russia, Iran, and Turkey, proposed a ceasefire so that they could solidify their control of these territories. Ultimately, we find that these countries are promoting their national foreign policy interests over the global collective interest for peace. And as long as this continues, we will find no peace anytime in the near future. But this problem is even more systemic, because as the Washington Post reported on February 28th, a new round of Syrian peace talks proposed by Russia and Iran had floundered because America was not there. That's right, last week, these peace talks had started, but a key player in this conflict, the United States, was gone from the negotiating table. And as a result, key parties, the Syrian government and the Syrian opposition, have yet to meet. These talks concluded yesterday. After five days of negotiations, no parties ever met. We see here that because these foreign powers are promoting their national interests in this conflict, that there will be no effort to propose some sort of real peace in Syria. And as a result, we can only see that a peace agreement is unlikely. With that, let's move on to my second point, that the Syrian regime is growing increasingly aggressive in Syria. On February, 20, on February 13th, the Carnegie Endowment for Peace reported that Syria, along with its Russian allies, have doubled down its efforts to retake territory under rebel control in Syria. You see, Russia, under the pretense of combating ISIS, has provided the Assad regime with air support, air supremacy against the rebels. And as a result, Assad has been able to capture the key rebel stronghold of Aleppo last year and continues a major military offensive against rebel-controlled territories in Idlib. We see here that the Syrian government is promoting war over peace, and it is using its Russian allies to help it. But, so as a result, we cannot see a sustainable peace in the near future. But along the way, the Syrian government has also grown more aggressive with its, with its violations of basic human rights. On February 13th, an Al Jazeera article reported that a whopping 13,000 political dissidents were killed over the span of 2011 until now in the infamous prison of Salehan. Now, the Syrian government only has only increased executions killing an alarming 50 people a week in this prison alone. Just yesterday, actually no, just when we arrived in Bangkok on March 1st, the United Nations officially accused the Syrian government of committing war crimes. As a result, with a basic lack of human dignity and human rights, and with the promotion of war over peace, it is clear that the Syrian government has no interest in peace. In peace. And without an interest in peace, we cannot see a sustainable solution in Syria. Now, let's move on to my third and final point. That even if peace prevails, even if we do see a peace agreement, if Assad is still the ruler of Syria, Syria will continue to exist in a state of instability. 
On February 16th, a separate article from the Carnegie Endowment for Peace reported that facing the final phase of conflict, facing defeat at the hands of Assad, rebel opposition forces can expect that when Assad returns to power, not if, but when Assad has control of the entire country, that he will institute a far-reaching purge of political dissidents, maybe even surpassing the purges that we have seen during the Arab Spring. What this demonstrates is that even if fighters lay down their arms, even if the conflict itself stops, the violations, the lack of respect for basic human rights and basic democratic rights in Syria will continue as long as Assad stays in power. And there is no better indication of this than the beliefs of the Syrian people themselves. On January 31st, Reuters reported that despite the announcement of potential peace under Assad, more and more refugees have continued to pour out of Syria, citing that they will never live a free life in Syria under Assad. Clearly, we see here that even if peace prevails, even if there is a peace agreement, now that Assad is likely to be in control of Syria, we will not see a sustainable, stable solution in Syria any time in the near future. Thus, ultimately, we can see that because of the involvement of foreign powers, because of the Syrian regime's increasing aggressiveness, and because that even if peace prevails, Syria will continue to exist in a state of instability, there will, no, there will be no sustainable solution. Anton Chekhov shortly died after his final play of tuberculosis. We can only hope that the voices and dreams of the Syrian people do not suffer the same fate. Thank you. A little bit short, so hold on here. Can the judges hear me? All right. My prompt is, is the two-state solution now a viable option in the Israeli-Palestine conflict? I repeat, 
Is the two-state solution now a viable option in the Israeli-Palestine conflict? Judges, are you ready? When I say the word wall, the first thing that might pop in your head is Trump. But for me, I think of the poem written by Robert Frost. One of the lines goes a bit like this. Before you build a wall, allow me to ask you what you are walling in and what you are walling out. And over the past 15 years, Israel has been building three walls, huge walls, around Palestine. Which begs us to ask, is the two-state solution now a viable option in the Israeli-Palestine conflict? I would say no, and for three main reasons. One, both, two, both sides believe in a one-state solution for themselves. Two, Prime Minister Netanyahu rejects international law. Three, is that the Palestinian Authority lacks legitimacy in the international scale. Now before we move on, let's dissect the question here. What do we mean by a two-state solution? Well, essentially, it means that both Israel and Palestine would have their own states and will be able to coexist together. A simple idea, but completely unfeasible in the way things are today. Which leads me to my first point. Both want a one-state solution. Now, according to a BBC article reported on January 20th, 2017, a Paris peace conference was held in January just this year between Israel and Palestine. Talks broke down just 10 minutes in as both sides refused to recognize each other, calling each other terrorists, mass murderers. And with that in mind, how can peace be achieved if both refuse to take the guts to, to realize that both sides are human and that both sides have a responsibility to take care of their own people? In fact, the Palestinian Constitution, if I'm not wrong, Article 5 already states that the Palestinian people must give everything, their lives, to take back their homeland from the Israelis. And this is only accentuated in 2014 during the Gaza conflict, when Israel blocked aid to enter Gaza and the West Bank. With both sides seeing each other as inferior, as subhumans, how can peace be achieved? Both want the total elimination of each other, a one-state solution for Palestine, a one-state solution for Israel. So if that's the case, it's impossible for peace to be achieved. On to my second point, that Prime Minister Netanyahu rejects international law. Now a big development occurred just last year, at the end of, or sorry, at the beginning of this year, as Resolution 2334 passed the United, St United Nations Security Council where they condemned Israel for building settlements in Palestinian territory. Netanyahu blasted the United Nations, claiming that it was one-sided, that it favored the Palestinians. But if we look at it, let's look at the United Nations Charter. Article 2, Section 4 of the UN Charter states that no country should ever violate the territorial integrity of any member state. And let's keep in mind, Palestine is a member state in the United Nations. So how can a two-state solution be possible if Israel rejects any decision made to further peace just because it might not be in their national interest? That is an unsustainable peace. On to my third point, that the Palestinian Authority lacks legitimacy in the international scale. The CIA World Factbook uh, mentioned that in 2006, Hamas gained a majority in the Legislative Council. Now, according to the United Nations and international organizations, Hamas is noted as a terrorist organization. Now, with that being said, a terrorist organization representing the Palestinian people only strengthens Israel's arguments and belief that the Palestinian people are just a bunch of terrorists. And now countries are not being able to work with Palestine simply because they don't want to be marked down as 
people who work with terrorists. In fact, just this morning, Prime Minister Netanyahu just took a road trip around Australia discussing further uh, trade talks. And this only is because Australia does not want to be deemed as a co-conspirator with terrorists. In fact, just last year, the, the New York Times reported that Australia has been funding Palestine to rebuild their infrastructure since the 2014 Gaza conflict and been, have, have given $25 billion. But now, because of Prime Minister Netanyahu making that step to visit Australia, to strengthen their ties with Australia, to distance Australia away from Palestine, no country will be ever there to back Palestine. Now, in 1989, President Reagan stood in front of the Berlin Wall saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Well, I say, Prime Minister Netanyahu, tear down this wall because Palestinians are being trapped under your command. Palestinians are dying in the sake for your bloodlust to achieve a one-state solution just for Israel. Thank you. The question reads, is ISIS a spent force? I repeat, the question reads, is ISIS a spent force? There exists an ancient Arabic proverb, ilatahim, meaning to grind into a fine powder. This has quickly become the battle cry of anti-ISIS fighters within Syria and Iraq. With ISIS losing massive, massive swaths of territory within Iraq and Syria, and ISIS in so much decline, we must now ask ourselves the question, can ISIS be defeated? Is ISIS a spent force? To which the answer is clearly yes, and yes for three reasons. First, ISIS is losing territories and fighters. Second, the Syrian government is reaching stability. And third, 
the international coalition against ISIS is only growing stronger. Let's move into my first point, how ISIS is losing territories and fighters. Al Jazeera reported on February 7th that ISIS fighters are increasingly besieged within Aleppo. Now they are in an increasingly precarious situation with the Syrian army advancing to the south and the Turkish military advancing from the north. ISIS is besieged within Aleppo, unable to bring in basic necessities that they need to continue the fight within the Syrian city, showing that they are losing control of Aleppo and is it only a matter of time before they completely cede control. We can also see this in a whole nother country, in Iraq. The BBC reported on March 1st that Iraqi forces has, have successfully cut off the ISIS escape routes from Mosul. They have effectively surrounded the city, setting up another situation just like Aleppo within Iraq, besieging the city and not allowing basic supplies for the fighters to leave and enter the city. In addition, Brookings Institute on January 5th reported that the main incentives for Islamic fighters are gone. Unfortunately, the Islamic fighters have had pay cuts of up to 50%, and as of right now, it is becoming increasingly difficult for foreign fighters to enter Syria and Iraq. ISIS is only losing their territories and their fighters, showing that they are in increasing decline and will be a spent force in the near future. Let's move into my second point, how the Syrian government is reaching stability. Let's keep in mind that instability within Syria was one of the main reasons why the Islamic State in existed in the first place. The Carnegie Endowment for International Peace on February 16th reported that this is the end game for the Syrian opposition. The final phase may be protracted, but the opposition is losing their options and they are rapidly dwindling within the country. This is also reflected in the United Nations' recent actions. The Guardian reported on February 23rd that peace talks have been resumed in Geneva, but these peace talks are slightly different. The issue of deposing, the, of deposing Assad as a dictator has been completely foregone within these peace talks. The international community is now looking to m create a stable and peaceful Syria within, with their peace talks. This will lead to, as the New York Times reported on February 23rd, that the UN is leading one final push to achieve stability within Syria. The fact that, the Syrian, that ISIS was able to become an Islamic state within Syria due to instability of the political scene shows that stability now will lead to a more stable future and the death to ISIS. ISIS is becoming a spent force because the political scene that exists within Syria is only becoming more stable and with more international help. Let's move into my third and final point, how the international coalition that fights against ISIS is only growing stronger. The Washington Post on January 14th reported that Iraqi fighters are picking up the pace for retaking Mosul from ISIS fighters. Now, they have been carrying out more daring attacks against in the, in the city with the support of international coalitions such as the United States and Saudi Arabia. In addition, Turkey has been taking strong steps to protect their borders from Islamic states. The Carnegie Endowment for International Peace on January 3rd reported that the Turkish military has taken new steps in combating ISIS with Operation Euphrates Shield. They have taken the matter into their own hands to stop the spread of ISIS across more borders within the Middle East. Within the United States, the CNN reported on January 17th that the Pentagon is now moving towards creating new proposals that are more dangerous towards ISIS for President Donald Trump. Russia is in increasingly incentivized in order to help their backed government within Syria, the Assad regime, maintain power and stability within Syria. From all aspects and from all sides, international coalition against the Islamic State is only increasing their efforts to destroy the Islamic State, increasing both ground attacks as well as airstrikes against the Islamic State, showing that they are rapidly becoming um, a spent force. All in all, when asked the question, is the Islamic State becoming a spent force, the only clear and logical answer as of right now is yes, and yes for three clear reasons. First, ISIS is losing territories and fighters, showing that it is already on the decline and already moving towards becoming a spent force. Second, 
the Syrian government is reaching stability. And this is important to note because the instability in the political scene within Syria led to the creation of the Islamic State in the first place. And third, in the international coalition against ISIS is only growing stronger and only increasing their military presence within Iraq and Syria in order to defeat ISIS. Ilatahim indeed. ISIS is currently being ground into a fine powder. Thank you. My question is, can the European Union effectively handle its refugee crisis? Can the European Union effectively handle its refugee crisis? Judges, ready? Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the Second World War, the world was shattered. Europe was in ruins, Russia was a smoldering wreck, and two of Japan's biggest cities were aflame. This was what the Japanese called the Valley of Darkness. Following this horrific war, was an unprecedented refugee migration crisis as hundreds of, as millions of people found themselves homeless with nowhere to go. We never thought we would see anything of that magnitude ever again. Yet here we are once more. With strife in the Middle East and in Africa, the pace of refugee migration is exceeding what we have ever seen before. So when posed with the question, can the European Union effectively handle its refugee crisis? My answer has to be yes, it can be done, but with only with three main conditions. Firstly, the board, stricter border controls can be done and they must be done. Secondly, 
European nations must integrate these refugees quickly and effectively. And thirdly, European nations must work together. Now let's just start with my first point. That is that the stricter border controls are possible and they must be pursued. The huge, uh, the main issue when it comes to migration to Europe at the moment is the magnitude, the scale at which it is occurring. We're seeing millions of people leaving the conflict in Syria and that is just to name one conflict. They are overwhelming many of these European countries and when they arrive in such large numbers, this ar many problems arise. Firstly, it is impossible nearly to really control who is coming in. This means that economic migrants are coming in instead of asylum seekers. Even people with radical views are coming in. In 2015, it was reported that actually, in fact, a large proportion of those refugees coming to Europe were actually from Eastern Europe. <laughs> Moreover, the issue with this is that when the, uh, the refugees are able to pick the countries they want to go to, they are mostly clustering up in a few select nations, nations they wish to go to, France, Germany, England. They don't want to go to Poland, and thus this is resulting in disproportionate amounts of them in certain areas, and this is creating mayhem and chaos in those specific nations. But however, now more than ever, the moral high ground is with those who preach stricter border controls. According to the Telegraph on the 11th of February, Marine Le Pen, the far-right national candidate in the French elections, who is advocating for tougher immigration policies, has actually been going and soaring in the polls expecting to reach the second round, which is something that has never been seen before in French politics. Moreover, Gert Wilders in the, in the Netherlands, a far-right candidate, also very popular. And then we must not forget Donald Trump, who is advocating to create and erect a wall with Mexico. All these people were elected, and it shows that the tide is changing. It is swinging towards the side of populism and those who are preaching for stronger immigration policies, tougher immigration policies. The Pope himself, according to the Express, pledged himself to this to some extent, saying that countries have the right to control their borders, and he has thus legitimized this effort himself in that manner. If one questions if this is feasible, one must only look to Hungary, which itself erected a huge fence. Controversial indeed, however, it was possible, and it did stem the flow into Hungary. Now let's move on to my second point, which is that these nations must integrate these refugees quickly and effectively. Lots of criticism, the main criticism by conservatives is that this huge refugee crisis and all these people pouring in is bringing in radicalism and terrorism. According to the BBC, in the Bataclan attack in Paris, 130 people were killed. In Belgium, at an airport, another terrorist attack. In Istanbul, uh, several as well. However, with proper integration, in which these people can be taught to work, in which they can be taught the language of the nation they are in, they can, they can integrate themselves, create a life for themselves, and reduce and maybe even break this perpetual cycle of poverty, which allows terrorism and radicalism to fester and expand. In a less extreme manner, we have also noticed that um, some refugees have been pursuing some rather unhygienic activities in public pools. They have also been gr seen groping women in public and criticizing the clothing people have been wearing. It is necessary for European nations to be able to educate these people on social, um, on how, so, how European society works and how to live and how to be able to interact with others. According to the CNN, this has actually already begun as certain organizations have begun circulating graphic novels on what people can and cannot do in society. However, this must be ramped up. To complement this, it is essential that education, especially for the children, must be ramped up. In countries such as France, in which uh, equality is stressed, in which resources in schools are equal across all districts, that is fair. However, these refugees, these children need more attention than others. They are coming from a war zone. They need the extra help. And this could then allow them to pursue higher education, get themselves a life. And this could, again, help halt that perpetual cycle of poverty and thus terrorism. And all this would be facilitated with the idea of the first point being that the border security would allow for the pressure on such infrastructure to be much less strong. Now let's finally move on to my last point, which is that European nations must work together. This is the, uni this is the European Union, ladies and gentlemen. They must work in a concerted, united effort if they wish to tackle this problem. It is unprecedented. It is essential. 
According to a 23rd article, uh, 23rd of February uh, BBC article, one of the main reasons for Brexit was in fact that the British wanted to be able to decide their own immigration policy. However, cloistering themselves up on their own little island and just saying no to all refugees is not going to help the European Union as a whole. They're abandoning the, the rest of the Union and all the other nations to their own issues, and that is not going to work. Reuters also shows uh, a disproportionate number of refugees arriving in Italy itself and not being spread around enough. We do not need a repeat of Eastern European nations sending busloads of immigrants directly to Angela Merkel's office. This infighting is not going to help the situation. They must work together. And until these three categories are met, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that no, the European Union will not be able to handle its refugee crisis, but if they do so, they will be. If they do not do so, and these refugees continue to suffer, as Otto von Bismarck once said, a generation that is dealt a beating is followed by one that deals one. Thank you. One more round of applause for our extemporaneous speakings. At this time, we have a break until the next uh, final, which is uh, original, uh, sorry, oral interpretation. And that starts at 12.30 back in this room. At that time, when teams come back in, we're gonna ask you to sit as a team and we'll have a designated area. There'll be a, a sign on the seats and that's in the tradition of IASIS. Um, but you have time now to go with your teams and, and grab something to eat. Uh, coach's uh, room has, uh, has food there. And then the cafeteria is open today. Shoshana is all the way over at the swimming area. You're welcome to go over there, but it's quite a, quite a hike. And we'll see you back here at 1230. Thank you. Spirit of IASIS, if I could please see the AICs. If I could please see the AICs. Right down here in the corner. <laughs> 